Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Those of you joining us in this uh, gymnasium, I'm sure by now realize our acoustics are very strange in here. They echo. So we can't do anything about that. Uh, but we're glad to have the space, glad to be able to accommodate everybody. You certainly are welcome. Um, I was asked to make two announcements, one from Tim. Uh, if your name does not appear on the roll there, uh, we'll check in. If it's not there, just write it there and, and Tim will make sure next time it's, it's there officially. Uh, because we do like to keep a record of those who are here. Now that we have more, uh, add you in. Second announcement, uh, Prudy Nichols, uh, it's kind of a strange announcement, but <laughs> she will admit that. It seems her husband takes a medication, right? Uh, and he was assigned, he was prescribed this medication, it's a heart medication, expensive, but he can't take it, as it turns out. It's called Xarelto, okay? Xarelto. So she has two unopened bottles of 30 tablets each and one that has been opened and a few tablets used and I'm sure the tablets that determined he couldn't take the medication but these three bottles are free for anyone who is, is on that medication so I, I make that announcement and that because it obviously is an expensive medication are there any other cool drugs being distributed? <laughs> <laughs> I do not know. I do not know. Might want to put my name on the waiting list. <laughs> I've got all of them. <laughs> <Santa. So, laughs> that's an unusual announcement. I've not made that kind of announcement before. All right. Uh, we are. I will just announce this and we'll ask God's blessing on our class. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we will begin at verse 6. Uh, so, let's pray. Father be with us, uh, with your spirit to open our hearts. Thank you for our, your word. And thank you that you give us understanding. And we pray that will be the case today. Always we pray that you will be glorified. We pray that uh, our understanding of the glorious gospel of Christ may be deepened. Thank you for our fellowship. Thank you that we're able to meet here. And we pray your blessing upon us in this class and in our worship this morning. We ask through Christ. Amen. Amen. I always... Uh, on Sunday afternoon, I get back, I start working for the next Sunday, uh, and the first thing I've got to do is to pick out the text, how far I want to go, and I look at it and I think, I'd like to cover it, <laughs> and then I look at it and I think, no, <laughs> and I take the little bite, and the reason for that is with this book, and, and I've read it before, and I selected it for that reason, but you know, you forget certain things. I knew this book is loaded with significant and exciting and wonderful doctrines. i just forgotten how many. So uh, I have to take little bites because each one of them has some significant, seems like some significant doctrine. I started making a list uh, yesterday of them. And if you'll just glance at verse 10, you'll know what I'm talking about. And that is why we are going to go from verse 6 in chapter 5 to verse 10 in chapter 5. Okay. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 
And you will recognize that here we have the doctrine of the judgment, and we have a picture of what is judged, judgment, final judgment, based on works. Okay, we'll get there in a moment, hopefully. That don't take too long. Um, throughout this whole section, there is this contrast that Paul is bringing out between what we have here and what we shall have. For instance, Paul, who suffered a good deal of persecution, he says that this is a, a light, momentary affliction. Light you know, compared to an eternal weight of glory. Light, weight, momentary, eternal, affliction, glory. You see the contrast. And, it, and this contrast is carried out throughout. We are now in the body and we shall be with the Lord. And it is that distinction we have here. So we talk, talked about it last week. And we, and we noticed last week all kinds of metaphors that he used. While we're in the body, we're in a tent. That's a temporary dwelling. It is made of an un, unsubstantial material that is uh, easily damaged or destroyed. That's a tent. But what is ahead of us is a building that is constructed, not with hands, but constructed by God, and it becomes a home, a dwelling place for us. So you have that, those, those metaphors. And then he has the metaphors of the tent becomes a, a garment that you put on or take off. And you see that language still here. So it's metaphorical because with these metaphors, these symbols, you can actually, you call to mind something. Oh, if you just spoke in, in literal, plain terms, it doesn't convey but as much because if you say tent, everybody's got an image. If you say garment, you have an image. And that image then is compared to something you say. So I think that is why Jesus used it, those, you know, the parables, that, and why throughout the Bible you have this symbolic language, metaphorical language. So, we have it continued here, so just be ready. So we are always of good courage. And he repeats that, please notice verse eight. Yes, we are of good courage. We'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We are of good courage. And one might ask, why would you say you're of good courage when continue, you're, you're being, harassed, you're being persecuted, you never know this may be your last day, there are enemies out to get you, and you say we are of good courage, you look at the things through which you went, all of the horrible physical uh, as well as spiritual uh, torment, and then he says we are of good courage. And, and this is all light, momentary. And you go back to the previous verses from last week. You can look back and see because we, we studied from up to verse six, first five verses of chapter five. And you look back there and, and twice he's going to say in this tent, that's the body, this life, we groan. And I told you, and I will tell you again, especially for those of you who are new today, that the word for groan that, that Paul uses there is the word stenotsomai. Uh, it's the same word you have medically when someone says you have stenosis. Stenosis is a, it's a narrowing. It comes from the Greek word means a narrowing. And so the idea of groaning here is the idea, I think, my, as I put this in my mental images, of, of being put in a, a vice and it's tightened up. It was like some medieval torture machine. It gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And Paul says, we're groaning. We are being pressed. And he said it twice. And here in these two verses, and I called your attention to verse 6 and 8, he says twice we are of good courage. Groan, good courage. Groan, good courage. How can you be of good courage when you're groaning? Well, Paul was, and of course the reason is he can consider that and he knows that's life, momentary 
affliction as opposed to the eternal weight of glory. And what is now a tent, you have a building, not made with hands, building suggesting construction and its construction of a sturdy substance and it eventually it, 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 it's a house it's a home in which we dwell he knew that and that could keep him going there's another point about that it's easy for us to say oh we're good courage when there's nothing wrong when there's, we're not any problem in our lives paul had lots of problems and he says, we're of good courage. So the fact that he can say, we are good courage, and repeat it, and say, yes, we are of good courage, indicates the reality of it. He's telling the truth. You wouldn't write that in the face of, and in the middle of the experience of suffering, unless it were true. We are of good courage. So uh, we are of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Um, I mentioned last week that this word for no, interesting word, because there are two Greek words for no. And one of them, gnosko, I imagine most of you have heard of that gnosko, that's a, a relational knowledge, that's a knowledge uh, that you, you increase in that knowledge and you, you affirm that which you know. It's like knowing God. You know God, you can understand Him better. And, and this is relationship that is established and you, you approve of it. There's another word for know. And that is the word perceive, oida. We perceive it. Um, you know, when you look around, we can perceive this room. I know there's an exit sign there. I know that this is a gym. I just perceive it. Nobody questions it. We perceive it. So he says, we perceive, and we just understand that, that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. That's just a given. You see, a given. Everybody understands it. And to be at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. There's a most interesting word there. Um, at home, in the moon taste, it, it is a derivative of a word that all of you know. Demos. Which means what? Heaven? People, exactly. We get our word democracy from it. The rule of the people. And you wonder how can it be that the idea of being at home in the body, that idea comes from people. I don't know, but it does. And I think maybe it's this. To be at home, you are with the people you love, the people who are close to you. That's your home. And it certainly does not suggest solitary situation. It suggests a community. And all that's in that word. It's translated at home. So while we are at home, in the moon taste, anytime you have the word in, it means in. It's like the English. The word for out is ek. So we know that we are in the moon taste, at home, in the body, and we are ek de moon men, away from, away from the Lord. And, and so here's the contrast. You can't have both at the same time. You are at home in the body, but in a sense of being actually in the presence of the Lord. When somebody, somebody was in, died, he went to be with the Lord. In one sense, we are spiritually with the Lord, but to be in actuality with the Lord, that's the difference. We can't, as long as we're in this body, we're away from the Lord. If we are with the Lord, we are away from the body. You cannot have both at the same time, and that's what Paul is emphasizing here. And, and it's emphasized throughout the New Testament. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For the moment, skip verse 7. 
and go to verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see how he switches in verse 6, at home in the body, in verse 8, away from the body and at home with the Lord. Still, you're seeing you can't have both at the same time, but he has now switched it around to say, I would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Um, there are other passages, of course, in, in, in Scripture where this same thing is brought out. <clears throat> Philippians 1. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So again, he's recognizing I can be here preaching the gospel to you and away from Christ, or I can be with Christ and away from you. And, and I don't know which I, I prefer, because I've got fruitful labor here, but I've got being with Christ there. So there is the situation. And that's what we perceive. That's what everybody perceives. Any questions so far? Now I skipped verse 7. Verse 7 is parenthetical. It's parenthesis. And yet many times we hear pastors preach on verse 7. But we walk by faith and not by sight. Out of context. Well, I guess it's all right. But the context is this. The idea that we can't have both at once. And so what we have here, we have by faith and not by sight. When we are with the Lord, it's no longer faith. It is sight, you see. And those don't exist simultaneously. We walk by faith and not by sight. And it is this faith that impels us. It is this faith that motivates us. It is this faith that guides us. And I'm stopping right here to say, I, you, Paul is not, and Christ is not, and never in the Bible is the word faith used as just faith without an object. Have you heard people, like people on television, like personalities, show business, politicians, whatever, saying, you know, I depend upon my faith. And you may have you wondered, faith in what? It isn't faith just by itself. I can believe that the moon is made out of cheese, you know, that kind of thing. You can believe anything, or you can persuade yourself, or say that you do. We're not talking about faith in religion generally, or in some religion, or in some religious leader, or faith in church, or faith in anything or anyone, we're talking, except Jesus Christ, we're talking about faith in Christ. And when that word is used, that's what it means, faith in Christ as we receive him through the gospel, that which we confess in our membership vows. And I want to make that clear, I mean, I'm sure you all understand that. And that's the way it's used. Uh, of course, before Christ, you have faith in God and faith in the promises of God, same thing. And thus the writer of Hebrews said, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of, not, of things not seen. So we are assured through faith and that enabled us to go through all kinds of things. And if you read Hebrews 11, that's a great chapter of faith by faith. Uh, Abel offered a more acceptable Sarah and all these people down there now that he goes mm -hmm. and then finally he concludes with these great words these all died in faith not having received the things promised but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth for people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would, not have, they, would have, excuse me, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he's prepared for them a city. These people 
All of these people of faith could have, and we're not considering here the effectual calling of God, we're just from a human standpoint going back. But they went ahead, and they went ahead because, as the writer of Hebrews said, they were looking for a better land. We're strangers and pilgrims in this land. We're looking for a better land. And you see, that's that same contrast. This land, better land. Good example, one more example. Uh, you, you know the one from John 20. Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to 10 disciples. Judas is gone. And Thomas was gone. For different reasons. And then later, the disciples told Thomas that Jesus had appeared. And Thomas said, well, I'm not going to believe that until I actually see the prints in his hands, the nails, and the nails went in to see the, where the spear went in his side. I'm not going to believe him. And I pick it up in John 20, 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? How many times have you heard people say, and maybe you've thought yourself, If I could just see Christ, if he just appeared, if God just appeared. I remember walking down the streets of some city in Europe with one of the young men who was along on one of our trips, and we were talking about the subject, and this kid said, I, if I could just see God. Well, Thomas did. But listen to what Jesus said. Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There's a special blessing for people who don't have to have empirical, quantifiable proof. But they, they trust and they walk by faith. That's the way it's supposed to be, that you believe in God, that you believe in God's word and what he's promised. So, when Paul says, we have this tent now, <clears throat> and we have a building that is constructed not with hands, but by God, that becomes a house for us to dwell, we believe that. And this is what he's communicating here. So, yes, we are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We would rather be ek de Messiah from the body and in de Messiah. It's again that word demos with, with the Lord. And that still fascinates me that to be in our permanent dwelling in heaven is, we're not living in isolation. We don't want to live in isolation now. We want families. We like people. We don't have this isolation. It's demons. It's people. Uh, I don't want to make too much of it because some words, it's kind of hard to translate that. And now we're ready for verse 9. Are there any questions so far? <laughs> All right, verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, whether we are in or ek, we make it our aim to please him. Do any of you have any other translation for those last few words? We make it our aim to please him. To be pleasing. Obviously that's the idea, Gerald, to be pleasing. Be pleasing. Right, you're from the uh, ASV? New American Standard. New American Standard. To be pleasing. Okay. And, and the word so is therefore. Therefore. Okay. Here's one of those words that is just beyond the ability of English speaking people, or I think about any language to translate. I wish we had our Greek lady, a uh, good friend of ours, Tim and I were talking before class, 
uh, are from Greece, I would love to ask her how would you put that into English. It is the word Sinasemuthithma. It is a com combination of the word philos. What does philos mean? Brotherly love. Love, brotherly love. And Time, which is your name. Timothy. And was me. Beloved of God. And it means honor. 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 So, but, listen, but here's, here's the thing. You didn't know that, did you? Timotheus is beloved of God. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, that's all what I've known all my life. But, it, but you're the Greek scholar. Yeah, I'm not. It, it, it does mean honor. It does mean honor. Yeah. It does yeah. mean honor. Right. Uh, but, okay, here's getting another assignment. <laughs> Take the name Timothy, which is your name, and make a verb out of it. In Greek or English? English. <laughs> well, she'll tell you, I'm pure Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't do that, can you? Anybody's name. You, Lewis, yeah. you can't take, make a verb out of your name. This is a verb. Pure Timothy. So it is, <laughs> therefore, Dio, you know, we, the idea is one of please God. We honor, we honor, that we understand, but we've got to bring love into that. We lovingly honor, or we honor with love to please him. It's kind of the idea, it is our honor, which we accept lovingly, to be pleasing to God at all times. That's the idea of it. But to translate it literally is, is impossible. And the, the reason I bring that up is I spent much time over the last week consulting version after version after version to see if anybody brought that in. And I'm thinking the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use the word honor and the word love and none of them do it. It's interesting that you're familiar with the Geneva Bible, the, the English Bible that was used uh, by the reformers. It was long before there was a King James Bible. Uh, it was in English, uh, it was printed in Geneva. Uh, it uses the words, we covet, <laughs> to be pleasing to the Lord. But anyway, that's the idea. I pass it on to you. Whether in the mutes, in the body, or et de mutes, out of the body, to be pleasing to him. A and we can get that idea. I also think God wanted to convey the idea that it is an honor that is executed with love to do everything <laughs> to please God. Any comments? Does that not tie back to the catechism, chief end of man? Oh, of course. To love God yeah. and enjoy Him enjoy forever. Him. And it's through our loving of Him that we actually have that enjoyment, we have that honor relationship. Totally agree. Totally agree. If you didn't hear Tim, he says that goes back to the catechism and what's the first duty of man. Um, so, any comment or question? We come to verse 10. Don't remind me, Daryl. <laughs> for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. We are judged by our works. Yes. The Bible teaches the standard of judgment are our, is our works. What got us in trouble to begin with are the works of Adam. And we're still under the covenant of Adam. Therefore, we must present to God perfect works. And they have to be perfect to enter in. You think of the scene in Matthew 25 when Jesus gathers all the nations before him and he divides them like a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And to the sheep he says, enter into the joy prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, and thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, and so forth. 
And to those on the left, he says, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry, and you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything, you know, naked and so forth and so forth. Works. But we're not saved on the basis of our works. We're saved on the basis of the finished work of Christ. But the works do follow them. <laughs> the works become the vindication of who we are. And the lack of good works become the, the evidence. Thank you, thank you, Roy. The, the justification of God's wrath. Yes, we are judged by works, but not individual works. Here's the point. I'm going to get this in. Here's the point. Many people, legalists, and here's what the Muslims believe, and I had a Muslim imam tell me this. <clears throat> we believe that all of your works are evaluated individually and separately. And if it's 51% good works, you enter into heaven. If it's not, you go to hell. And the same way with legalists. They believe individual works, and if, you're, if your good works outweigh your bad works, you'll be saved. Case in point, this gentleman whom I deeply loved and tried to help him understand the idea of being saved by God's sovereign grace, and yet, when he was about to die, at the age of 100, in the nursing home, he turned to his nurse and he said, tell me, have you done enough good that you can go to heaven? He didn't get it. That's still the idea that they have. If you do enough good, you can go to heaven. In a sense, that's true, but that is merely an evidence of vindication, and it's not individual works. I can tell you that, based on the way this is written, and I probably don't have time to go into all of it. But there's a little Greek word here that kind of puts it all in, in one unit. All of your works are seen as a unit, either totally good or totally bad. For a Christian, we've made mistakes, but that's why we confess our sins. We make mistakes, and our sins are forgiven, and our works are sanctified by the Spirit. And so, when we appear before God, our works are a unit. The Greek word, by the way, is ta there. It's a plural for simply the, the, the article the. And they're seen as good. For a person outside of Christ, they're seen as bad. And people argue, well, people outside of Christ do great things, wonderful things to help others. They, some great doctors or whatever they might be. But they did them with no reference to giving glory to God. And that's an insult to Christ. And even though they might, in the view of man, be considered good, because of that, they're considered evil, you see. Does that make sense? One other thing. We'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ um, in order that actually we may carry away that which we have done, whether good or bad. And the judgment seat is the Bema. The Bema was a raised, a raised dais, and on it sat the judges of that city, and the accused stood before them, and they gave judgment. The Bema, every Greek speaking person would know what a Bema was. And especially in Corinth, because the Bema still <laughs> exists, you can see it. It's still there. The judgment seat. More from the New Testament, perhaps, in Corinth than anywhere else. So they would understand that. You're brought before the Bema, and you must give it a penalty. And if you're in Christ, you're accepted. I think I made it. Any questions? Body that we're talking about being present, yes. the body of the church, the body of Christ. Yes. For we, we receive according to that which we have done somatos in the body. Yes, exactly. This body, this tent, this tent that we're in now. And that is a significant doctrine. And we didn't have many minutes to do it, but we can talk more about it next time if you have any questions. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for 
your gospel. We thank you that uh, through your spirit we can understand. Thank you for this day that you've given us to worship. And we pray we may use it to your glory. Be with us now as we enter into our corporate worship and bless us as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth for your glory and the upbuilding of your people. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here today.